Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to this session on Ethernet networking. We're streaming live on Facebook, Twitter, Periscope, and YouTube. So uh, please do feel free to ask questions, put them into the chat on any of those platforms, and they will come through to me here. And um, as soon as I uh, get a chance to, I will answer those. So please do ask your questions. This kind of piggybacks on the, the back of a session we did last week. Uh, to do with DMX and RDM. So if you uh, are interested in that, go back onto any of those platforms and you can re-watch the session that I did uh, last week. So I hope that's helpful to you. Uh, so we are talking about Ethernet networking. Um, and so I think it's always helpful to start off by saying, why are we here? Um, and if I was in real life, we would have a setup that looks a little bit like this. It would be the, the simplest setup that I can think of. A simple console, a simple moving light, and a bit of cable that's running in between them. And I would say down that cable, we want to be able to do three things. We want to be able to, oh, sorry, we'll just jump through these bits. Uh, we want to look at this cable, and down this cable, we want to, be able to do three things. We want to be able to go and configure our lights. We want to be able to control them and we want to be able to monitor them. We want to be able to see what is going on. And so in the previous session, we looked at how we can do these three things uh, using DMX and remote device management. And in this session, we're going to be looking at how we can do those three things over Ethernet networking. And so we're going to do that by looking at the following agenda. We're going to look at some terminology, first of all. We're then going to compare DMX versus Ethernet and understand the differences and the similarities. We're then going to look at uh, ArtNet in a little bit more detail, and we're going to then look at streaming ACN and RDMNet in a little bit more detail. And if you're not familiar what those are, hopefully by the end of the session you will be. Uh, but like I said earlier, please do feel free to ask any questions that you might have. Now the terminology is only going to take two or three minutes. We're going to look at eight key words, so the same words as we looked at in the DMX session. So if you did watch that one, uh, bear with us for two minutes as we go through, make sure everybody's familiar with them, and then we'll go on from there. So the first piece of terminology we're going to look at is the word protocol. Protocol is a, a set of rules or a way of doing something to get data from one place to another place. If you were to meet the queen, uh, there is a protocol. There is a way you deal with that situation, a way you have to behave, certain list of things you have to do. And exactly the same is for protocol. So if we want a console to speak to a moving light, we need to get data from the console to the moving light. And we're going to do that by using a protocol, a set of rules. Now, those sets of rules, they could be a standard. A standard set of rules means that um, a, a group of people have agreed that's the required level. That's how we're going to transfer data from one place to another. We're big fans of standards at 088, DMX, RDM, Streaming ACN, RDMNet. They are all standards. Lots of companies have all come together and agreed that... Um, that's how we're going to get data from one place to another. And that means you're not locked in to a particular manufacturer because they're using standard ways of speaking. I am speaking to you in English. That's a standard. As long as I speak English and you speak English, we should be able to communicate together really, really well. So that is a standard. The opposite of that would be proprietary. This is where um, a particular person or a particular company has defined this is how we're going to do it. And often that means uh, that you're locked into that company's product. If you want to use their console, you have to use their moving light or a situation such as that. So proprietary um, often means that the, the company can do stuff quicker than maybe their competitors. But as for you as an end user, if things are talking in a proprietary protocol, um, it locks you out of being able to talk to other products out on the marketplace. So uh, you get standard protocols and you get proprietary protocols. Now, we're not talking about anything analog today. We're talking about digital signals, but analog signals, if you were to cut open a cable and if there was any way of kind of listening to what's going on down that cable, um, an analog signal would be continuously changing, continuously variable uh, as it passes that data. Um, but what we're talking about is 
digital signals. So digital signals, if you could cut that cable open and listen to what's going on down it, it would be a, a series of ons and offs, or highs and lows, or ones and zeros. There's different ways of wording it. But we get a much cleaner signal at the end of our chain. So the device at the end of the chain, it's much easier for them to know exactly what's going on with a digital signal. So streaming ACN, RDMnet, Rnet, all Ethernet based protocols, they're all digital, including um, so as are DMX and RDM, which we talked about in the previous video. The last two that I just want to cover before we start talking about the actual subject. One is unidirectional. So far, this um, broadcast has been unidirectional with me speaking into a camera. Um, it's happening in one direction. Uh, DMX, for example, is a unidirectional protocol. Uh, but I'm hoping you're going to ask some questions, and when you ask those questions, this will turn into a bi-directional communication. Things are happening in both directions. I'm going to speak to you, and hopefully you're going to respond and speak back to me. Um, and protocols such as remote device management are bi-directional. Things can happen in both directions. So in unidirectional, the console can speak to the light, but the light cannot speak back, for example. But in a bi-directional situation, the console and the moving light can talk to each other and pass information backwards and forwards. So that's just some terminology. Hopefully it will become clear shortly why uh, making sure we're familiar with what those uh, words mean is important. The, the big chunk of today, we're going to look at comparing DMX versus Ethernet. We've got an hour in total to cover a lot of things, so we're not going to be able to go super in-depth with anything, but hopefully we will be able to point you in the right direction, clear up a few things, um, and so on. So that's the, the aim now. So when we're comparing DMX, we're going to compare uh, into three categories. First of all, why? You know, DMX is working fine, isn't it? Why do we need to move over to Ethernet? Number two is the hardware. So we're talking about the connectors, the cabling, how we wire it all up, etc. And then number three is the, what I've called software. That's a really bad term, but it's just the opposite of the hardware. I'm talking about the stuff you can touch, so the configuration. So the, the main one we're going to look at is how you address things on an Ethernet network. So that is our agenda for comparing DMX and Ethernet. So why Ethernet? Why on earth do we want to use Ethernet? Well, the big thing is it has higher bandwidth. So um, with DMX, we're limited to 512 channels down a single cable. And that was absolutely fine back in the 1980s when DMX was first developed. But now um, it's not fine anymore. We've got moving lights, we've got LEDs. These are devices that use large numbers of channel per device. And so that 512 limitation, uh, we run out very quickly. and. Um, if we do run out, we need to run another cable and another cable and another cable and we could be easily running 20, 30, 40 um, universes on a medium sized show, um, many, many more than that on larger shows. So um, the big thing that Ethernet gives us is much higher bandwidth than DMX, many more channels down a single cable. Now the second reason specifically why Ethernet rather than why an alternative solution to that problem is that much larger industries in the entertainment industry have had the same problems in the past. They needed to get large amounts of data from one place to another place quickly and reliably. Um, the main industry that have had that is the IT industry. They've needed to get uh, data from one side of an office to another side of an office or over the internet, etc. And they've solved this, they've solved it with Ethernet. And so it makes sense for us to jump on that same bandwagon and solve it in the same way. So that's another good reason to use Ethernet. Uh, third reason is scalability. Ethernet works really well in small systems and really well in large systems. It's not um, necessarily fair to say that DMX is for small systems, Ethernet is for large systems. Actually, Ethernet is really scalable. It works absolutely fine for small, medium, large, really large uh, networks over uh, small venues, over large, large range of venues. So uh, that's a good thing. And then lastly, um, if you're living on an Ethernet network, you get all this other stuff kind of for free. So with DMX, down your DMX cable, there's not that much stuff you can do. You can control your lights, and if you're using remote device management, you can configure them and you can monitor them. But once you live on an Ethernet network, um, you can do much more than you could ever dream of doing on a DMX network. So this is a list, and you know, it's out of scope to talk about each of these individually, but things like using applications on your phone or your watch to be able to control your lights, having automatic backups, visualization, remote monitors, multiple consoles, multiple users, 
all of these sorts of things become available to you once you're living on an Ethernet network. So um, it's, it's a definite benefit, but it's, we're not going to talk about those specifically in this session. Okay, so let's talk about the hardware um, and specifically the connectors. This is the, um, the, the main connector for Ethernet networks. It's called an RJ45. It looks a bit like this. I'm sure we've all seen them. And the main problem with that for the entertainment industry is this little tab here. I'm sure we've all had situations where that tab has broken off uh, become damaged and then the the connector doesn't really stick into the the correct port reliably enough um, and so in the entertainment industry we're going to be much more interested in using this uh, which is the Nutric Ethercon connector the middle section here is exactly the same as the RJ45 um, but Nutric have put this metal surround over it very similar style to 5-pin XLR DMX um, which makes it a much more rugged connector, much more suitable for putting hundreds of them into a big flight case trunk and pulling them out and so on. So the connector we're going to be using either is absolutely fine, um, but for most situations, especially touring, we're going to be using the Nutric Ethercon connector. So that's the connector. Now we're going to talk about the cable briefly. Um, I could do probably an, an hour's presentation about cabling alone. So we're going to just big picture level stuff now. Um, Ethernet is a lot less forgiving than DMX is. With DMX, you can kind of cut the cable open and use a knife just to rewire it if you need to and use some electrical tape to stick it back together and it's not ideal, but it would probably work if it was the only option you had to make sure your show happened. Um, Ethernet's gonna be a lot less forgiving. So you need to follow the rules. You need to use the correct cabling. You need to use the correct connectors. Um, if you've ever looked in an Ethernet cable, um, you were to cut it in half again you would see eight cores going down that cable and those cores are paired up so you have four pairs and each of those pairs um, are twisted around each other very tightly and when you get to the connector you have to untwist the pairs so you have eight separate cables um, and then you can put feed those into the connector even just untwisting those pairs too far, I've seen connectors sometimes where the connector is this big, but the cable comes out here before they start twisting again. Um, even untwisting the pairs too much can, can cause you issues. So just be careful with that. Be sensible. Try and do as neat a job as possible. Um, cable lengths. Um, copper, so normal Ethernet cables, uh, are 100 meters limitation. Uh, so DMX is theoretically over a kilometer, but we generally say 300 to 450 meters, uh, whereas copper is only 100 meters between devices, it is. that's a slight difference compared to DMX, so between devices it's 100 meters. Um, we don't want to be running anything at maximum, so actually we would always recommend using 80 meters as your uh, max calculation of how long you can run a cable from point to point. Um, and Whereas DMX is a male end and there's a female end and they plug together very nicely, generally that's not the case with RJ45. Generally you'll end up with a, a cable that's male on both ends. And so if you want to connect two cables together, let's say you had two 40 meter cables and you wanted to connect them together, uh, you would generally need to use what's called a coupler, a female to female coupler or a crossover connector, depending on what you're trying to achieve. Um, and you plug those in. If you think what's happening there, this cable is untwisting, which remember we said the twists are very important. So this is untwisting, then it's going into a connector, then going into the coupler, and then across the coupler, and then back to the other cable, and then retwisting. Um, so just that device, which might only be two or three centimeters big, um, you need to treat that as if it's 10 meters of your overall limit. So remember your limit is 80 meters, and that little connector, because of everything that's going on, it's almost like reducing your overall limit by 10 meters. So we would see a 40 meter cable and another 40 meter cable and one of those couplers in the middle, not as an 80 meter cable, although physically it's 80 meters, we would treat that as if it's 90 meters, which means it's still technically under the 100 meter limit, but it is above the 80 meter rule of thumb. So we'd be a little bit cautious with the reliability of that cable. So this all sounds relatively negative, 100 meters is not that far, It's a quarter of the length in some cases from DMX. Um, but the option when you're living on Ethernet is that you don't have to use copper, you could use fiber. And once you use fiber, um, you can go many, many kilometers without any issues. Um, we're definitely not gonna get into the complexities of fiber and terminating that. Um, 
uh, apart from to say get a specialist to do it so if you need to run cables and or especially if you're installing cables get a fiber specialist to uh, do a nice clean neat installation of your fiber okay so uh, topology topology is just a posh word for um, how we're wiring up the system and so this is the DMX topology uh, we probably know it as daisy chaining the official term is a bus topology and you come out from the desk and you go into the first product out of that into the next one and so forth all the way around until the end where you have that um, DMX terminator um, we also talked about in the DMX and RDM session you could use this device which is a DMX splitter and that allows you to run separate cables to your dimmers and separate cables to each of your lighting bars but you've now got three lines so you do need to have three terminators in that chain so that's the DMX topology that we're all very very familiar with um, an Ethernet topology is not a bus topology an Ethernet topology is a star topology which means that you have this box in the middle I'm just going to call it a box for now um, and there needs to be a cable going to every single device so a cable going to your console a cable going to each of your dimmers a cable going to each of your moving lights and you can imagine if those moving lights and dimmers were in a circle with the box in the middle that would look a bit like a star so that's why it's called a star topology and this is the topology for Ethernet this is how IT networks work how the internet works it's this star topology going on now we can tidy this up a bit by having some more of these boxes and again I'm just using the term boxes for now we will come into what they are uh, shortly and um, so you can see that still that reduces the cabling somewhat but imagine that was physical cable on a physical lighting bar that's still a lot more cable than we're familiar with and used to with DMX and that's going to become very messy very quickly that bar and um, so that is quite a significant downside um, of Ethernet now some people some manufacturers I should say are putting these boxes again just use the term boxes for now putting this box inside the product so it's still to start topology but by putting it inside the product itself you can simulate the equivalent of what we're familiar with with DMX so imagine there's a box inside this light and so you've then got a cable going to that light and a cable into that light and then there's another box inside this light and a cable and a cable and so on and so forth so some people some manufacturers have done that uh, greatly reduces the cabling um, greatly um, makes the system more familiar to the installers um, but this is not official this is not technically how you want to be doing it in an ethernet world and um, this is um, it's not proprietary but it is specific to each manufacturer so you just be a little bit cautious that you read up and understand exactly how they're achieving this and make sure you're comfortable with that so that's the topology um, so I said this idea about a box and I showed you some boxes let's talk a little bit more in depth about what these boxes are with some some terms used when we're distributing Ethernet so the first term you might have heard of is a node there's a bit of confusion about the word node especially ArtNet uses the term node in a slightly different way so a node is a device that is attached to the network doesn't matter what that device is so your smartphone your Apple Watch your laptop whatever it is they are nodes they're devices that either create Ethernet data or receive it they transmit whatever they do they live on the Ethernet network whether it's wireless whether it's wired they are nodes and so in um, the lighting world your console would be a node your moving light if it had Ethernet straight into it that would be a node they're nodes now a hub is a type of node it, a hub lives on the Ethernet network and so that makes it a type of node and a hub is the closest equivalent we have to a DMX splitter uh, it has lots of holes in the front and you plug in your Ethernet cables into it and whatever data you chuck into one hole it comes out all the other holes so it's very similar to a DMX splitter a DMX splitters generally have an input and lots of outputs that's not quite how Ethernet works so you just plug them all into any hole and whatever data you shove in one hole comes out all the others but a hub is pretty um, historical we don't use it that often anymore they've mostly been replaced by what's called a switch and a switch is an intelligent hub or an intelligent um, splitter if you like again it lives on the Ethernet network so it's a type of node 
Um, and the way that a switch works, when you first turn it on and you've got all your cables plugged into it, it works exactly like a hub. Whatever you chuck in one hole comes out all the other holes. But bit by bit, it starts learning, it starts listening to what's coming in and out of all of these holes and going, okay, well that message is for that particular device and I know that particular device is plugged into hole number seven. So rather than send it out all the holes, I'm only going to send it out of hole number seven. Um, and so a switch starts to build up this understanding of what's on the network and where data has to go. And that greatly reduces the amount of data flying around your network. And if you manage to reduce the amount of data that's flying around your network, that allows you to then add more data in and increase your bandwidth. So um, switches are really important to make sure you don't have unnecessary data flying around your, your Ethernet network. And then lastly, we have something called a gateway. Again, gateways sit on the Ethernet network, so they're a type of node. Um, and a gateway uh, converts one protocol to another protocol. Okay, so that's one protocol to another. So I'm speaking to you in English. If you didn't speak English, maybe you spell, uh, spoke Welsh, we wouldn't be able to communicate. Uh, we would need a translator, somebody that understands both English and Welsh, and they would sit in the middle and they would listen to the English and then they would convert it to Welsh and then they'd listen to the Welsh and convert it to English. That's what a gateway does, but for protocols. So a gateway might listen to ArtNet and convert it to DMX, or it might listen to streaming ACN and convert it to ArtNet. So a gateway just sits on the network and takes, um, uh, takes one protocol and converts it to another protocol and that might be a physical device or it might be a piece of software on your laptop that's just converting one ethernet based protocol to another okay uh, so i would love to have physical products and show them to you but uh, that's not possible uh, currently so if this is just two examples of how a gateway might look these are our two uh, we call them the gateway four and the gateway eight uh, they um oh sorry just go back there. Uh, the Gateway 4 supports four universes of DMX, so you can send ArtNet or streaming ACN into it. Remember, that's how a gateway works, it's a translator. So you send it Ethernet, ArtNet or streaming ACN, we'll get onto the differences between those in a minute. And then it outputs four universes of DMX. So one cable going in, four DMX cables coming out. Gateway 8 does exactly the same thing, one cable in, but eight universes out on that device. And that doesn't have to be universes 1 to 8, it could be universes 1, 20, 43, etc, etc. Um, and you can see they come in different shapes and sizes. Um, you've got a rack mount version there and you've got a, a version that can just get attached straight to your rig or be put on the desk. Um, that gives you an idea of what a gateway might look like, but it might also be software as well. It doesn't have to be a physical hardware device. Okay, so now we come on to the uh, configuration of the devices, um, which I kind of badly entitled software earlier. Um, the first thing to think about is a MAC address. You might have heard of that. Um, there's various terms for it, a physical address, hardware address, etc. Not really that useful to us in terms of communication. It's one-to-one. -one, so uh, I don't think we've had any questions yet. I don't know how many people are listening to this presentation. Um, but if this was one-to-one, -one, I would have to redo the presentation each and every time for each and every one of you. Um, it's not an efficient way of communicating, especially if you've got uh, hundreds of moving lights and you want them all to go red, having to send that message to every single light may not be the most efficient way. Um, so MAC address, we don't want to be using that for communication. Um, generally, MAC addresses are fixed on the device. So a device from the factory will be given a unique MAC address. That should be unique worldwide. No other device in the world should have that same MAC address. Um, and it's static. You can't change it on the whole. There are some exceptions to that, especially with laptops and cybersecurity and all those sorts of things. But on the whole, MAC address is locked onto the device and you don't really need to care too much about it. What you're going to care a lot more about is IP addresses, um, stands for Internet Protocol, and there are 4 billion of these available to you. Um, I've kind of made this comparison of how many IP addresses there are compared to DMX addresses. That's not really a fair comparison because devices on the Ethernet network still have a DMX address as well. Um, but it gives you an idea of scale that an IP address, there's 4 billion of them, DMX address, there's 500 of them. So you, you kind of see the scale there. Um, 
I am going to be talking about what's called IPv4 version 4 throughout the whole of this presentation. Um, you might have heard of IPv6 version 6, uh, which is even more than 4 billion IP addresses. Um, it was in the news maybe last year or the year before that uh, the world had run out of IP addresses and you might have heard that and so uh, we made the switch to IPv6. Um, but for the vast majority of um, entertainment situations, we're going to be using a dedicated um, network. We're not going to be connected to the internet, we're not going to be trying to send lighting data from one side of the world to the other side of the world. We're going to be a dedicated network within a dedicated building. And so for that reason, this 4 billion limitation is kind of irrelevant to us. Um, I don't know any entertainment venue that has 4 billion devices within it. So um, I, we're using IPv4 for now. And I, from the top of my head, I can't think of any venues that are running IPv6. I'm sure there are some. Um, but the vast, vast majority of people, IPv4 will be absolutely fine. So we're talking about that. Um, and so an IP address is represented by four numbers. I'm sure you've seen them before. 192, 168, 5, 10, those sorts of numbers. Um, there's four separate numbers where each number can be anywhere between 0 and 255. Some of the numbers are kind of reserved for particular uses, but, you know, four digits, anyone can be between 0 and 255. You get static IP addresses. They're ones that uh, you have set. You've gone into the device and said, this is your IP address. You also get dynamic um, IP addresses, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, and the IP address is split into two parts, um, and this is where uh, IP addressing can get a little bit more complicated. So an IP address is split into two parts that's called the network address and the host address. Um, and so uh, this can be quite confusing to explain, but we're going to have a go visualizing it. Um, in the following way. So here I have a building, I'll just bring me back. So here we have a building um, and in this building there are lots and lots of people. Here they all are. Um, and they're all talking to each other and that's fine. But if one of these people wants to speak to 10 people around them and another person wants to speak to another 10 people, that's going to get very noisy very quickly. It's going to be hard to hear them, there's going to be lots of unnecessary noise going on. And so in the world, we solve this by having a wall. And so we put a wall in this building and we say, right, if you want to be in that conversation, go over there. And if you want to be in that conversation, go over there. Um, and that's great. We can now have two conversations without all the background noise. And so we're not having to continuously ask, sorry, I missed that. What was that? Etc. Et um, So that wall has made this a lot more efficient. But I can't have as many people in each conversation as I could when it was one big building. Because one big building, I could have everybody listening to one thing. Now I put a wall down, I can have two things going on at once, but I can only have half the people in one and half the people in the other. Now maybe that's still too much, I need uh, some more conversations to be going on. So we put some more walls in and now I can have more conversations going on, but each one of those rooms less and less people can fit into each of those rooms because the rooms are smaller. And we go on and we go on until we end up with lots and lots of rooms with only a few people in. And for this reason, this is how we deal with life, um, for this reason, there are lots of different types of buildings. There are um, arenas where you have one big room with you know, tens of thousands of people. You have schools where there's lots of rooms that can fit kind of 30-ish people in each room. Um, you have flats where you have lots of much, much smaller rooms where you can only fit two or three or four or five people in each room. So that's how we deal with this in the world. When we want to have um, conversations efficiently, we put walls in and we split up our rooms. And networks are identical to that. We have a, an IP address, but we split it into two parts, the network address and the host address. And the network address is a bit like the room number, and the host address is a bit like our names. We have names, and that allows us to communicate with each other. It's much easier to be able to say, oh, let's talk to that particular person by addressing them by their name. So that's how an IP address works. And we split the IP address, remember it's split in half with a network address and a host address, but the split is done using something called a subnet mask or subnetworks. And it splits the IP address into its two parts, remember the network address and the host address. Now, 
Frustratingly, um, a, a subnet mask looks very similar to an IP address. It is four digits, um, and it can be a value between 0 and 255 on each of those four digits. However, it can't be any value between 0 and 255. It can only be a few of them. And actually, for the case of today, we're going to simplify even more and say that each of those four numbers can only be a 0 or a 255. So it could be 255, 255, 255, 0, or it could be 255, 0, 0, 0, um, but it's going to be four numbers that are either 0 or 255. And we're going to simplify it even more than that, because actually the 255s have to all be together, and they always have to be at the beginning. So you could have 255, 0, 0, 0, and you could have 255, 255, 255, 0, because the 255s are all together and they're at the beginning. But you couldn't have 255, 0, 255, 0, and you couldn't have 0, 255, 255, 255. Okay, so the 255s have to be at the beginning um, and they have to be all together. Um, so much more limiting than an IP address is. It limits which devices can talk to other devices, so that's the purpose of it. And the benefit of doing that is that it ensures quicker communication times. So it allows us to get communication to somewhere quicker, just like it does in real life. When we put walls into a building, it allows us to communicate quicker because we can hear things better. We're not having to ask people to repeat themselves, etc. So we're gonna have a go at um, explaining this. Uh, so here is a device, let's call it a lighting desk. It has an IP address and it has a subnet mask. And in this case, its IP address is 192.168.0.10, and its subnet mask is 205.0.0.0. Now remember that IP address is split into two parts. It's split into the network address and the host address. Um, and it's the subnet mask that's doing that split. And you'll notice we've visualized it here. Where the subnet mask is 255, the equivalent bit in the IP address, which is 192 in this situation, that is the network address. It's like the room number. I'm room number 192. And where the subnet mask is zero, which here is 168.0.10, that's like the name. My name is John. And so when I go into a room, I say, hi, my name's John. And if anybody wants to speak to me, they say, hi, John. Exactly the same. You go into room number 192 and you say, hello, 168.0.10. And if you say that, you'll be able to speak to that device. Okay, so that's, uh, that, let's say this is a lighting desk, for example. And let's uh, bring in some other devices here. So uh, we will bring in three more devices. Let's just call them, uh, let's have them as moving lights for now, just to keep it nice and simple. And my picture's covering up a little bit of that, but just like the two devices at the top, it just says IP address and subnet mask in exactly the same way. Um, so you can see all of these devices have the same subnet mask. And not only do they have the same subnet mask, but the network address, the bit at the beginning, is 192 on all four of these devices. So they are all in the same room. And because they're all in the same room, they can talk. And you'll notice that the host address is unique for each one. So that's great. They can communicate each other, with each other without any confusion at all. So they're in the same room, the same network address, and they've got unique host address, a unique name. And so those devices can talk. So um, let's have a go at extending the subnet mask. So we're going to change these zeros here and we're going to make them 255s. Okay, so now our subnet mask on all four of these products are 245, 245, 0, 0. And that means that the network address is now bigger than it used to be. It used to just be one um, number, now it's two numbers. So in this case, on the top device, the network address is 192.168. By doing that, we have many more rooms available to us by increasing the subnet mask, many, many more rooms, so many more networks available where devices can communicate in those networks. And as you will see, and we'll look at this in a bit, as we make the more and more rooms, the names, the, the host address reduces in size. And by reducing in size, that means we can have less devices in each network until we run out of unique addresses. So we've made the room number bigger. So there are more rooms available to us, more networks. But notice how two of these devices, we've not changed the IP address on them, we just changed the subnet mask on them. Two of these devices now live in completely different rooms. The top device and the bottom device, they live in room 192.168. 
but the middle two devices live in different rooms and so they cannot communicate with each other or with the other two devices because it's like they're in a room on their own. And so if we want those devices to talk to each other, we have to go and change their IP address. And so we can change their IP address to 192168 and now all four devices live in the same room and they all have unique IP addresses, or, sorry, unique host addresses. Um, and so we're back to a fully working happy system. So let's do that process one more time, make these zeros 255s, and you'll notice we have the same problem again. By increasing the subnet mask, uh, three of these devices cannot talk to the lighting desk anymore. In fact, every single device is in its own unique room. Um, and so if we want to fix that, we need to go and change the IP address, make sure they're all in the same room. So put them all in, in this case, 192.168.0. And now they're all in the same room, and so they can all talk to each other. But notice, by making the room number much, much bigger, we can have you know, thousands and thousands of rooms now. Um, in fact, many more than thousands and thousands. Um, the, uh, the host address is much smaller. In fact, it's one number, and that number can only be between 0 and 255, and some of those are reserved as well. So let's say just over 200 devices. So we can only have 200 devices in each room. Now, for the vast majority of small, medium, Theatres, that's probably fine, especially if they're running Ethernet for most of it, but still running a bit of DMX as well. They're not going to have more than, say, 200 devices. That's not a problem. But it's very easy to imagine that there are more than 200 devices, and so you would have to make your subnet mass smaller, 255.255.0.0, for argument's sake, and which would allow you to have more devices in that room. And in this situation, like I said earlier, you can have many, many thousands of rooms that's probably not realistic for the vast majority of entertainment networks, so it's unnecessary. You may as well make that room number smaller and have a, a bigger host address. So I hope that's helpful. I hope that clarifies um, the difference between a network address and a host address um, and how an IP address is split into those two things by using the subnet mask. So hopefully that's helpful. Um, I don't think we've any questions yet, but please do feel free to shoot across a question if you have any. Okay, earlier I said that an IP address can be static or dynamic, and we said static was when you go and type in the IP address and it's, you've given it the IP address. But if that's just too much to think about, um, you can use something called DHCP, uh, Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol, and that will manage your IP addresses for you, and then you don't have to think about IP addresses, you don't have to think about subnet mask, it is all managed for you by a device. Um, there is um, a lot of difference of opinions within the entertainment industry. I've heard some companies say, oh, always use DHCP, never bother doing it yourself. And I've heard other companies say, no, always do it yourself, do not use DHCP. Um, it's completely up to you. Um, it, it really doesn't matter too much. If you're the sort of person that likes to know exactly what's going on and have your paperwork up to scratch, then you probably want to be using static. Uh, if you couldn't care, you just want it to work, DHCP will be fine. Um, yeah, so hopefully that's helpful. Uh, you've been listening to me for uh, almost 40 minutes now, so we've got just a 40 second video uh, that introduces DHCP. So I hope it's useful. Uh, have a listen to this and then we'll go into it in a little bit more detail. When I'm on a network, why do I have to worry about giving my lighting console an IP address when I don't worry about my phone's IP address at home? Well, that's simple. At home, you have something called a DHCP server. It's probably hiding away in your router. You could always add a DHCP server or a device with one built in to your venue's network. Every device on the network needs a unique IP address to communicate. Instead of you setting that manually, keeping track of all your devices and ensuring each of their addresses are correct, your DHCP server sits there waiting for a new device to join the network and then automatically provides it with all the network settings it needs, including IP address, meaning you don't have to worry about it. Isn't that kind? There you go, a 40 second introduction to DHCP, mostly so you can have a break from uh, my voice for a bit. Um, DHCP server uh, assigns addresses to devices automatically. Uh, it's a really fast way of setting up your system. Um, just something to be aware of, um, when you turn off a device and turn it back on, there's no guarantee that device is going to be given the same IP address. That shouldn't be a problem, um, but just be aware of that. It might be given a different DHCP um, address. Um, not the end of the world for you, but if you like your paperwork, then maybe that's a bit more of an issue. 
Uh, nice comment from Adam there. Thank you very much, Adam, about the um, explanation of um, IP addresses. Adam, on, uh, you think you're on Facebook? Uh, feel free to post any other additional uh, tips you have, and we'll share those with everyone. Um, if there's any questions or anything, feel free to, to post them there. Okay, so that's DHCP. And that's the end of that section, which is by far the biggest section comparing DMX versus Ethernet. Hopefully, um, that's explained why we might want to transition from using a DMX system, which is fine and nothing wrong with it at all, but why we might want to tr transition to using an Ethernet-based system and some of the similarities, but also several of the differences that we're going to come up against when we do that. We're now going to talk about ArtNet and then we're going to talk about streaming ACN and RDMNet. So just as a, an introduction, these are the actual protocols that we're sending over Ethernet. So what we've done up to now is got a load of devices talking to each other. Um, but what we've not actually done is sent a message from one to the other. We've just got them all on a network so they're able to talk. We've got them into the right rooms, we've given them the right names, we've given them the ability to talk. And that's what Ethernet does. But it doesn't actually get data from one place to another. If you imagine um, the train network around the country, um, that's a bit like Ethernet. You've got all the, the stations and all the links between them and how those links are going to work and the timetables and all of that sort of stuff. But that is useless if you don't actually put people or cargo onto those trains to get them from one place to another. And so ArtNet, Streaming ACN, RDMNet, they are different ways of getting content from one place to another place over this Ethernet network that we've just created. So uh, that's just a, a quick introduction to the differences there. So ArtNet, um, so it's owned and it's copyright by Artistic License Holdings, based here in the UK. Uh, so they own full copyright of ArtNet 4, which technically makes it a proprietary standard, which is what we talked about earlier. Sorry, a proprietary protocol, I should say, sorry. Um, but they have made it free of charge, they've made it royalty free. Anybody can go and download the standard, um, and as long as they put a copyright notice into their manual, not a problem, they can go and use ArtNet. And for that reason, it's become incredibly popular and it became incredibly popular incredibly quickly. Um, and it's a great way of getting DMX type data from one place to another. And in fact, ArtNet supports much more than just DMX. It supports a lot of different things. Um, and one of the things we'll see in a minute, it supports remote device management as well. Uh, it supports 30,000 universes. Uh, so remember, a universe is 512 channels. So it's the equivalent of running 30,000 DMX cables. Now, there's going to be lots of silly big numbers like this. Um, if you run a DMX cable from one place to another, I can tell you that you can get 512 channels over that cable. I can tell you you can get more than 511 and you can get less than 513. It, 512 is how many channels you can get over that cable. Unfortunately, Ethernet not that simple. Um, it depends on every element of your network, the quality and the type of cabling you're using, the types of um, switches you're using, yeah. so, so many things. So when we say RNet supports 30,000, I would argue that's a, a theoretical maximum. There's very little networks in the world where it would support that. Very, sorry, very little entertainment networks in the world that would support that. Um, but you can tell that if you're dealing with 50 or even 100 universes, you're so under that limitation, you shouldn't be concerned by that at all. So just because you've gone and bought a, a, a $40 router from your local IT company, don't expect that to be able to deal necessarily with 30,000 universes of ArtNet. Just be a little bit careful. Now, some people have made some devices where you have kind of two network cards in your computer and it blasts the system with data to see how much data it can get and it presents you back with a, a number. But that is going to be per, very specific to each site and each setup. So just, just be aware of that when we're talking about these big numbers. Um, they're a bit harder to talk about than DMXs. ArtNet supports uh, node discovery, and node is just a device that's on the network. So any other device that supports ArtNet, um, you can go and find it and you can manage it. So from your lighting console, you can sit behind it and you can go and find all the other ArtNet devices on your network and you can manage them remotely from your lighting console. 
uh, so really powerful uh, time saving feature. Um, ArtNet supports multiple controllers, so a big limitation with DMX is it's single controller only. You can have one controller and no more. Uh, there are devices called DMX Merge, but just to be clear what they're doing, they are taking two different controllers, um, bringing them to one box, merging the data in the box, and then sending out a single stream of DMX. So it's not the devices at the end, your moving lights and your LEDs and so on, they are still only receiving a single stream of DMX. They are not receiving multiple controllers. So um, just to be clear there. Whereas ArtNet supports multiple controllers, um, supports two in fact, um, and so you can have two controllers sending data for the same device to the device and then it's the device at the end that receives both of those streams of data and then the device can decide how it's going to deal with that which one is it going to listen to and generally that's done via what's called highest takes precedence or latest takes precedence so um yep um and I need to remove myself here. Uh, Artnet supports remote device management. Now, um, if you're not familiar with remote device management, go and watch the, the hour-long session we did last week on um, RDM. It uh, will clear it all up for you. But in short, remote device management allows you to go and uh, configure and monitor your lighting fixtures. So you can go from your console, you can say, go and change your DMX address to this, go and change your mode to this, go and invert your pan to this. And you can also, from your desk, say, okay, what temperature are you running at? What is your lamp life at? Have you got a stuck color wheel? Anything like that. You can do it all via remote device management. And ArtNet allows all those same messages to be sent, but using ArtNet. So um, using a single protocol of ArtNet, you can do what you need two protocols to do on DMX, which is DMX and RDM. So hopefully that's helpful. Um, okay, sorry, I should have removed myself again. The last thing we can do on ArtNet is um, a, a ton of other stuff that's kind of out of scope of this um, presentation, but things like synchronization, if you're sending thousands of universes or even just several hundreds of universes down a cable, you need to make sure that when you hit go, that happens at the same time down all of those universes. There's no point universe one happening, then universe two, then universe three, then universe four, because however quick that is, you might start to see differences. Um, but uh, ArtNet solves that by something called synchronization. It also deals with triggers, it deals with time codes and, and all sorts of other things. And so that's the end of my overview on ArtNet. It allows you to configure, it allows you to control, and it allows you to monitor. So the three things we want to be able to do. Okay, hope that's helpful. Any other questions on ArtNet, feel free to shoot them uh, as questions on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, or Periscope. Next, we're going to look at streaming ACN and RDMNet, which are an alternative way of doing, on the whole, the same job as ArtNet. There are differences, as you would expect, but you know, fundamentally, their job is to get DMX data from one place to another over Ethernet. So uh, let's have a look at these shortly. So yeah, kind of what I just said, DMX and RDM. Between them, they're two separate protocols. Um, streaming ACN does the equivalent of DMX. So DMX does not allow you to configure your fixtures. It does not allow you to monitor your fixtures. It does allow you to control them. Streaming ACN does exactly the same thing. Uh, so again, we'll give you a, a 40 second break from my voice to show you this quick video about streaming ACN. You're probably familiar with DMX. It's the bit of cable connecting the light and rig together, allowing your console to control your lights. Well, streaming ACN or SACN is the equivalent, but over Ethernet cables. It has several advantages, the main one being that you can control many, 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 many more lights through just one cable. Some lights accept SACN straight into them, whereas for others you need a box called a gateway to convert SACN to DMX. SACN has a few additional cool features. Two lighting consoles can both output SACN at the same time, but with different priorities. This could be a backup console or a second console in a different location. Whichever has the highest priority will control your lights, but when turned off, the other console automatically takes over. Okay, so there's your overview of streaming ACN. Uh, a nice message from Ken there on Facebook. Thanks, Ken. Good to hear from you. Uh, yeah, so streaming ACN. 
Uh, it's kind of the equivalent of DMX over Ethernet. I put unidirectional there. Uh, no Ethernet protocol is truly unidirectional, but uh, for all intents and purposes, what we care about is we can get data from one place to another, and we can get that from the console to the fixtures, not really the other way around, not, not in the other direction. So um, streaming ACN is the equivalent of DMX. It is an American national standard. This is a big deal. It's, um, we said earlier, Artnet is technically proprietary. It's owned by Artistic License, but they have made it free, royalty free for anybody to use. Um, Streaming ACN is a standard that's been developed by ESTA, which is an uh, organization based out in America, and they've made it an American national standard. This is the same body that makes sure that when you plug your mobile phone into the wall to charge, your mobile phone doesn't blow up. Yeah, it's a big deal that the entertainment industry have protocols that are ANSI standards. It means a lot of work's gone into it. It means that everything's been documented, that everybody's had the opportunity to comment and to suggest changes on it that's been reviewed again it's been documented and so on that process takes much much longer to develop a standard using the the ANSI model but hopefully at the end of it you have a protocol that loads of companies have all said yes we've signing up for that we agree that is a really sensible good way of getting data from one place to another so um Although you might not think you need to care that it's an anti-standard uh, as an end user, um, there is a big benefit to you in that it should give you a lot of reassurance. Streaming ACN um, supports theoretically 63,999 universes, so roughly double what Artnet supports. And um, again, I'm going to call these theoretical in that you need some some serious network equipment to be able to reach those numbers. But you know plenty more than the vast majority of small, medium, or even large uh, venues are going to be dealing with. Uh, streaming ACN supports multiple controllers, but it does it in a different way to Artnet. So if you remember, Artnet supports two controllers, and uh, then it mixes those, either high, highest taste precedence or latest taste precedence. Streaming ACN can support more than two controllers. Um, and it does it via something called prioritization. So on the controller, on your lighting console, you give it a priority, a value between 0 and 200. Um, and then the device that's receiving all this data, so there might be uh, six different consoles and one sending a priority of 10 and another one's 20 and another one's 30 and another one's 40. The device at the end looks at which one has the highest priority and listens to that one. But if that one suddenly disappears, it's already receiving data from the next highest priority, and so it just switches over and starts listening to that one instead. So uh, that is how priorities um, work and how streaming ACN deals with multiple controllers. Um, sorry, it has uh, a preview mode. Um, so preview mode... Um, allows the lighting console to send out a message. My title's restarted there, apologies. Uh, preview mode um, allows the controller to send out universes, um, but listed as preview rather than live. I think this is a fantastic feature that is not used enough on streaming ACM. So um, your console could send out universe one, but it can send it out twice, once as live data and once as preview data, and those two data, they might be different. The levels in each of them might be different. So, for example, you might have your console sending out your current queue, let's say queue number five, your current queue out to the stage as live streaming ACN data, but your console might be sending out queue six, your next queue, as preview data and that goes to a visualization package, for example. So at all times, you've got the live data on stage for what's going on now, but you've got a visualizer set up to the side, and on there, you, you can see what's gonna happen when you hit the go button, and that shows you that. And it might be that when you go into something like blind, the console automatically changes to show the blind data as preview data, so your visualizer is showing you what's happening in blind, whilst your live data to stage is happening as it should be, and no one knows any difference. So, really powerful feature there called preview mode. Um, and last thing to talk about with streaming ACN is, is it has synchronization in exact, well, pretty much exactly the same way that Artnet has synchronization. And so that is an overview of streaming ACN. Earlier I said it is the equivalent of DMX. 
And so it's probably not too much of a surprise that RDMNet is the equivalent of RDM. And it allows us to configure and it allows us to monitor what's going on on our network. And so I've got another 40 second video to show you about RDMNet. You might be familiar with RDM. It works alongside DMX to allow your console to monitor and configure your lights. Well, RDMNet is the equivalent, but working over Ethernet cables alongside Stream and ACN. Feeling lazy? With RDMNet, you can change the address of your lights, monitor its sensors, and much more, all from your console, and without getting the ladder out. RDMNet adds plenty of other features too, such as supporting multiple consoles. It does this by using a device called a broker, which talks to everything on your network, making sure they're all kept up to date with what's going on in your rig and ensure they play nicely together. A broker might be a physical device, but more likely it'll be a feature of your lighting console. Okay, cool. So uh, that is your introduction to RDM. Uh, it's the RDM, sorry, RDM net, it is RDM for Ethernet, providing the monitoring and configuration like I mentioned. Uh, it is another American national standard, remember that gives you uh, the reliable, hopeful reliability and confidence in the protocol. Um, it supports multiple controllers, streaming ACN supports multiple controllers, so RDM net is designed to work with streaming ACN and so it has to support multiple controllers. But it's a lot, lot harder to support multiple controllers when one controller can go and tell a device to change its DMX address, well then all the other lighting consoles on the network also have to know that that's happened. And so they've had to use this idea of a broker, um, which can be a little bit confusing, um, it may not be the most elegant solution for end users, but um, we expect that a broker will be a piece of software that you might not even know about that's tucked away in your lighting console and it just makes it all work and you don't have to worry about it. And it will only be when you get into much larger installations or um, events where there is a physical device called a broker that's managing all that. But we suspect for the vast majority, you might not even know there is a broker on your system. It's just a bit of clever software, making sure that when one, when one lighting console tells a fixture change to DMX address 15, all the other consoles get that message as well, so they know that they now need to talk to that light on DMX address 15. Um, RDMNet supports discovery, node patching, and then obviously all the RDM messages, just the same as ArtNet supports. So remember, ArtNet had all of these features. Well, remote device management, sorry, sorry RDMNet has them, uh, a very similar setup. Um, but obviously this is now an American national standard rather than the proprietary but free to use protocol of ArtNet. Um, it includes something called LLRP. Um, and I think LLRP is going to be the biggest feature that people care about with RDMNet because it solves a massive real life situation. And that is when you get a device, maybe it's like one of those gateways I showed you earlier. Um, you don't know what IP address that device was set to. It was last used on a show two months ago, maybe. No idea what IP address it is. But to be able to go and configure it, you need to have another device plugged into it, and those devices need to be on the same network. And if they're not on the same network, they won't be able to communicate. Um, and so how do you solve that problem? And what we normally do, most people, is they get a pen and they prod it into a hole somewhere, and then they turn the device on whilst prodding this hole, and that sends a reset command and the device resets, and then you find Google and you find the manual for the device and that tells you what the default IP address is, or, or something like that. Well, LLRP is going to hopefully solve that problem, and so we have the last 44 second video to show you. Ever wondered what LLRP stood for? We thought not, but we'll tell you anyway. Devices on an Ethernet network, such as your lighting console, moving light, or Ethernet gateway, use addresses to define what they can and can't talk to. If these addresses are configured incorrectly, devices will have difficulty communicating. But how can you change a device's configuration that you can't talk to? We often just end up looking for the reset button. Introducing LLRP, or Low Level Recovery Protocol. It's a simple protocol which allows your lighting console to find all the devices on your network, even when they'd normally be considered unreachable. Now they've been found, you can configure their network addresses from your console and talk to them properly. It may not be that interesting, but it is useful. Okay, so that's LLRP. It's part of RDMNet, technically. Um, 
but we're seeing a lot of people just implement the LLRP bit for now, um, just to, to get a quick turnaround. I should have said earlier, RDMNet was only released last year, end of last year, so it's still very new. Um, there's not that many products that are supporting it yet, and so lots of people are going, well, LLRP is the big feature. Let's get that um, supported, let's get the software tested, and let's get it released, and then we'll look at everything else second to that. So we're seeing that a lot. Um, so we have... Streaming ACN, which is the equivalent of DMX, we have RDMNet that is the equivalent of RDM. And so when you bring those together, it's a tick for configuring your console, your devices, it's a tick for controlling them, and it's a tick for monitoring them. You can do everything you need to be able to do, just like you can with DMX and RDM, and just like you can with ArtNet. So I hope that's been helpful. Earlier we said why Ethernet, and we said, well, it's got higher bandwidth, uh, which we've seen. It's, 30,000 on ArtNet, 60, over 60,000 on streaming ACN. Uh, it can scale, and then you get all this other stuff built in um, when you jump onto it. Um, and that's the end. That's completed our session. I hope it's been helpful to you. I hope that um, it's given you a bit of an exclamation, exclamation of um, the difference between DMX and Ethernet, and uh, why you might use ArtNet, why you might use streaming ACN and RDMNet. There are a ton of more resources out there on the internet. You do go and take a look at them. Um, you know, we cannot talk about everything in a one hour session, but hopefully this has given you uh, a good overview of what you need to care about um, and, and so on. If you've got any other questions, we've got more training sessions. Uh, just head over to zerotate.com to see when they are. I think we're having a break next week and then there'll be some more the following week. All of the training sessions we've done this week and last week are all on YouTube, all on Facebook, and all on Twitter, so go and have a, a read of those. If you've got any more questions, I, don't, I can't see any more questions coming in now. Uh, if you do, feel free just to quickly type them. If you think of a question later, feel free to email us, support at 0 uh, and one of the team will get back to you with the answers to your questions. So I hope it's been helpful. Please do feel free to use our support emails and, and so on to, to answer your questions. Um, but if there are no more questions on Facebook, Twitter, or YouTube, uh, we will call it a day there. So I hope it's been helpful. Thank you very much for joining us, and we'll speak to you soon.